Hyponatremia in the Critically Ill Child by Dr. Andrea Moscatelli. My name is Andrea Moscatelli. I'm the director of neonatal and pediatric intensive care unit at Casalini Children's Hospital in Genova, Italy. In the next few minutes, we will talk about the treatment and prevention of hyponatremia in the critically ill child. We will start with the definition and pathophysiology of hyponatremia. Then we will go through some case presentation and we'll uh, focus on the treatment and prevention of hyponatremia. Pathophysiology of hyponatremia. You have hyponatremia when there is a relative excess of free water with an underlying condition that impairs the kidney ability to excrete free water. This might happen in case of excessive intake of water, if there is a marked reduction in the glomerular filtration rate, or if there is a renal hypoperfusion, either if there is an ADH excess. This condition is affecting 25% of the critically ill children. Uh, it is considered moderate if sodium is below 130, and this condition is affecting more than 1% of hospitalized children. Uh, serum sodium is strictly regulated by uh, some interplaying mechanism. Uh, the first one is the increase of vasopressin. Vasopressin is increased by the posterior hypothesis in response to stimuli like uh, a reduction in the circulating volume or in an increase in plasma osmolarity. While the renin angiotensin aldosterone system mm -hmm. is able to announce the reabsorption of sodium and water in case of hypovolemia. The sympathetic nervous system has similar effects to the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. Uh, atrial natriuretic peptide has opposite effects. So if you think about the cell, the main intracellular ion is potassium, while the main extracellular ion is sodium, and urea is able to move freely across the cell membrane. So to measure uh, the plasma osmolarity, you can go through this formula who takes into account sodium, glucose, and the BUN. But if you think about the driving force for the movement of water across the sun membrane, you should think about tonicity. So you wouldn't take into account urea, which is able to move freely across the sun membrane, and you just take into account sodium and glucose. By using the above formulas for osmolarity and tonicity, or by measuring a patient's osmolarity as a lab value, you can assess whether they are hypoosmolar or hypotonic, serum osmolarity of less than 280, isotonic serum osmolarity of 280 to 295, or hypertonic serum osmolarity of greater than 295. A patient's osmolarity and tonicity are important in assessing the causes of hyponatremia. Types of hyponatremia. We will address the issue of hypertonic hyponatremia and we will skip to other conditions which are hypertonic hyponatremia and pseudohyponatremia. Hypertonic hyponatremia is a condition that you see in case of hyperglycemia or in case of manitol infusion, while pseudohyponatremia uh, is uh, a condition that is related to the sodium measurement in plasma when you have high levels of proteins or lipids. So if you have a kid with hypotonic hyponatremia, the first thing to do is to assess the volume status. Is, if the patient is hypovolemic, the next step is to measure urinary sodium. If the urinary sodium is above 20 millimoles per liter, you should suspect renal losses. While if the renal sodium is below 20, you should suspect extra renal losses. If the patient is euvolemic and the urinary sodium is above 20, uh, the most probable diagnosis is an appropriate increase of ADH. While if the patient is hypervolemic, and the urinary sodium is above 20, uh, the most probable diagnosis would be an acute or chronic renal failure. While, if sodium is below 20, 
You should suspect a secondary hyperaldosteronism like in nephrotic syndrome or in cirrhosis or heart failure. We will now briefly talk about hospital-acquired hypernatremia. Consider that hospital-acquired hypernatremia is leading more than 600 kids to death in the United States it's each year in the postoperative period. So it is extremely important to prevent hypernatremia in hospitalized children. And the way to, that, to do that is to limit hypotonic fluids to patients with have a serum sodium of, about, of above 145 or a urinary free water loss. And to use normal saline or D5 normal saline as maintenance fluid in patients at risk of ADH excess, like in the conditions that are listed below. Correcting severe hyponatremia. The approach to treatment of hyponatremia depends on the underlying etiology, degree of symptoms, and whether the hyponatremic state is acute or chronic. Sometimes hyponatremia is associated with hypovolemia, so the first thing to address is shock and correct the volume status, and this can be done with normal saline. And after that, you should focus on the correction of hyponatremia. And you can predict the changes in serum sodium with one liter of infusate with this formula. Here you have the sodium in the infusate plus the potassium in the infusate minus the serum sodium in the patient divided by the total body water and plus one liter that you give. So if you have a 30 kilogram kid with a serum sodium of 130 who is administered with one liter of normal saline, what would happen is a change of 0.7 milliequivalents per liter in serum sodium. So normal saline is not effective in changing the serum sodium. And if you want to correct the serum sodium, it's better to use 3% hypertonic saline. Point of clarification. Hypertonic saline is often indicated for correction of severe hyponatremia in a patient who is acutely symptomatic with neurological symptoms such as encephalopathy or seizures. Once the neurological symptoms have improved in the context of a rising serum sodium level, treatment with hypertonic saline can be stopped and ongoing serum sodium correction with normal saline can be initiated. So the usual approach is to start with 2 mLs per kilogram of 3% hypertonic saline given in 10 minutes, with a maximum of about 100 handhelds in, in one bolus. The bolus can be repeated one, two times until symptoms of acute encephalopathy are reversed. So the goal is to have an increase of 5 to 6 milliequivalents per liter in serum sodium in the first one to two hours. And it is wise to recheck serum sodium every two hours. The therapy should be stopped when the patient is symptom free or if there is a, ri a rise in serum sodium of more than 10 milliequivalents per liter in the first five hours. The correction in the first 48 hour hours should not exceed 15 and 20 milliequivalents per liter. And you do, do not have to target normal or a normal or a hypernatremia. If the brain is exposed to an hypoosmolar environment, there is a movement of water from the extracellular compartment to the intracellular compartment leading to brain swelling and the increase of intracranial pressure. There are several factors that can be considered risk factors for the development of brain swelling and intracranial hypertension, which are young age, because in young children, there is a high brain to skull volume ratio, but also an underlying central nervous system disease 
like meningitis or brain tumor or hypoxia. The thing that you have to be aware of is that early signs of hyponatremic encephalopathy can progress very rapidly into advanced signs and symptoms of hyponatremic encephalopathy and they indicate a rapid progression through the development of intracranial hypertension leading to possible brain herniation. The brain tries to compensate to this status with a rapid adaption that is due to the extrusion of uh, sodium, potassium and water from the brain cells. And to this rapid uh, adaption follows a slow adaption which is due to the extrusion of idiogenic osmolites like glutamate and glycine. This is a slow adaption and in, in this moment we correct too rapidly sodium. This would lead to a, a brain shrinkage which can cause osmotic demyelination. The osmotic demyelination is a severe damage of the myelin in the brain and usually occurs after a slow adaption which takes about 48 hours to occur. Risk factors for osmotic demyelination are chronic hyponatremia lasting more than 48 hours, an increase in serum sodium of more than 25 milliequivalents in 4 hours, hypoxia, liver diseases and malnutrition. Here you see how osmotic demyelination can present on an MRI. On the left side there is a typical presentation with the pons lesions, but also other areas of the brain like the basal ganglia can be affected. What happens after the correction of sodium is that you have initial clinical improvement associated with the correction of sodium, which is followed by a neurological deterioration in 2-7 days with mutis, dysarthria, spastic quadriplegia, pseudobulbar palsy, ataxia, locodin syndrome. One third of the patients recover, one third remain disabled but are able to conduct an independent life, and one third are severely disabled. Cases. We will go now through several case presentations which are illustrative of the concepts that we have talking about previously. Case 1. So, case 1, we have a previously held kid, 13 years old, 38 kilograms, on postoperative day 2 after appendectomy, presenting with generalized seizures. He uh, has been treated with diazepam and phenytoin, intubated and on mechanical ventilation. He has been given about 2.7 liters of D5 abnormal saline on day 1, drunk an unknown amount of water and is euvolemic responding to pain. Serum sodium is 112, serum potassium is 4.4, serum, serum osmolarity is 228, urinary osmolarity is 500 with a urinary sodium, of one ha sodium and potassium of 100. Given that the patient is euvolemic, what is your diagnosis? Please click the new comment button to leave your answer. So, in this case we have an hypotonic hyponatremia uh, with a urinary sodium which is well above 20. This picture shows how the intracellular and the extracellular compartment, compartments behave in this case and the diagnosis is an acute condition called inappropriate increasing of ADH. So you can have high level of ADH vasopressin uh, in patients with hyponatremia that can be due to readily reversible causes like a low effective circulating volume but also uh, they can be, it can be due to anxiety, stress, pain or nausea or to the administration of drugs that are causing nausea, like chemotherapeutic agents or morphine. Uh, there are also not easily reversible causes, li like vas vasopressin-producing tumors, central nervous system diseases or lung lesions, and granulomas. Case 2. Case 2. We have a 
10 kilogram, one year old child, surgical removal of a mastocytoma. Uh, the postoperative fluids were D5, uh, normal saline at 40 ml per hour. After 25 hours from surgery, uh, the baby develops a decreased level of consciousness and seizures. The fluid balance is 400 ml negative, and uh, there is a weight loss of 0.5 kilograms. The baby is tachycardic. Serum sodium is 120, serum potassium is, is 4, and serum osmolarity is 238, with a urinary osmolarity of above, o, o, um, above 600, and the urinary sodium and potassium of 260. What is the patient's volume status? Please click the new comment button to leave your answer. Now that you have assessed the patient's volume status, what is your diagnosis? So, this case is similar to the previous one. You have an hyponatremia, uh, hypotonic hyponatremia uh, with level of potassium and sodium in the urine, which has very high. But as you can see, the patient is tachycardic, so he is in a low volume status. Here again, we can see how the extracellular and the intracellular uh, compartments behave in, in this case, and the diagnosis is a cerebral salt wasting syndrome, which is another acute condition. And it is quite difficult to make a differential diagnosis between these two conditions. The most important issue is the assessment of the volume status because while in, in, in the case of inappropriate uh, increase of IDH you don't have hypovolemia, you have hypovolemia in case of cerebral salt wasting syndrome. And it is extremely important to put together several different parameters in order to make the right diagnosis, having in mind that the most important issue is the assessment of the volume status. Case three. Case three. We have a three kilogram, five months old baby uh, with bronchopulmonary dysplasia who is admitted for an incarcerated hernia. Uh, he had poor feedings in the last three days and presents with, with loss of consciousness and seizures. He has been under hydrofluorothiazide for BPD and is fed with the amino acidic formula. Uh, serum sodium is 105 serum potassium is 2.2, serum osmolarity is 205, and the urinary sodium and potassium is above 20. What is the patient's volume status? Please click the new comment button to leave your answer. Now that you have assessed the patient's volume status, what is your diagnosis? So here again, we have an hypotonic hyponatremia with low levels of potassium in, in, in plasma, but with urinary sodium and potassium, which are above 20 milliequivalents per liter. Uh, this condition is similar to the, uh, to the previous ones. Uh, the patient is with a low volume status, but the main difference is, this, is that this is a chronic condition. And the other thing is that, as you can see, potassium is a major concern. So you can start with correcting potassium instead of correcting sodium. Consider that if you are infusing potassium, uh, it's like infusing sodium. And so when you correct potassium, you either correct sodium because potassium is going inside the cells and there will be an opposite movement of sodium outside the cell with a rise in the plasmatic sodium. In this picture, which is identical to the previous one, we can see the behavior of the extracellular and the intracellular compartments in this condition, which is, as we said, a chronic condition due to the loss of free water and sodium. It is extremely important to make 
a differential diagnosis between an acute and chronic condition because this would affect the way we treat hyponatremia. Case 4. Let's put everything together with the last case. We have an 18 months old kid, 10 kilograms, two days of gastroenteritis, who is admitted for intersusception result with a contrast anemia. Not evident hypovolemia, but the impression is of mild dehydration. The patient is presenting with severe pain and nausea. After 20 hours from admission, the patient presents with seizures. He has been given with 200 ml of normal saline. The maintenance fluids have been two-third D5 in water and one-third normal saline at 40 ml per hour plus 200 ml of water as ice chips. Serum sodium is 134, urinary osmolarity is 320, urine output is 0.5 ml per kilo per hour and the urinary sodium and potassium are about 200 mL equivalents per liter. To understand what has happened to this patient, we have to go through a tonicity balance. The usual total body water for, for this patient should be 7, liter, 7 liters, and this is given by this formula, 0.7 times 10 kilograms. But because of the losses that he had, the actual volume, sta volume status is 6.3 liters. Now, if we make a balance between the ins and outs, Ins are the infusions. And out is what the patient is losing with urine, and it is something that we can measure instead of diarrhea. We can understand that in this case we have a positive balance of sodium and a positive balance of free water. And we can calculate the new sodium levels through this formula by multiplying 134 mL equivalents by 6.3 liters and adding the positive balance of sodium, this divided by the new volume status that would be 6.3 plus the volume that we have been giving with the fluids. So this patient has a serum sodium of 120 mL equivalents per liter. In, in this patient, sodium is low because of the excessive administration of free water with fluids but also because there was a retention of free water that was due to non-osmotic stimuli to the secretion of ADH. Remember that this patient was presenting with pain and nausea and the urine was concentrated. The usual behavior of a patient after volume expansion is the suppression of the secretion of ADH leading to diluted urine. So this can cause an overcorrection of serum sodium. And if this happens, you have to be careful to monitor the urine sodium and osmolarity and eventually replace the urine output with hypotonic fluids. So the prevention of the overcorrection of hyponatremia is a key issue and you have to monitor carefully for water diuresis, and you have to limit the administration of hypertonic saline to the correction of sodium or the use of normal saline to the correction of the volume status. It is important to restrict sodium-containing fluids when you have a water diuresis and to replace the diuresis with IV fluids which are isotonic to urine. Be also careful about the correction of potassium because this would increase the serum sodium. Summary. 
Hyponatremia is defined as serum sodium of less than 135 milliequivalents per liter. Hyponatremia may result from a variety of different insults or underlying disease states. Clinical signs and symptoms of hyponatremia range from nausea and vomiting and headache to seizure and coma. Determination of serum osmolarity, volume status, and urinary sodium are important for determining the etiology of hyponatremia. Know how to differentiate between the syndrome of inappropriate antidiuretic hormone secretion and cerebral salt wasting based on volume status. To conclude, if you have a patient who is hyponatremic but he is also hypovolemic, the first thing to do is to correct hypovolemia. Always consider the duration of hyponatremia because if hyponatremia is lasting less than 48 hours, it is an acute condition. If it is lasting more than 48 hours, it is a chronic condition. And you can take more time to correct serum sodium. Always assess the volume status, the plasma osmolarity, and the urinary osmolarity. Use 3% hypertonic saline for serum sodium correction because this would be more easy and monitor the response of urine osmolarity to the correction that you do. Thank you for listening to this lecture on Optum Pediatrics. Please help us improve the content by providing us with some feedback.